So welcome everyone to everyone that's on Zoom and to those that are watching us on Facebook Live. Apologies for uh, the abrupt ending of our webinar a few weeks ago. So this is our, uh, our, our redo attempt and uh, I think we'll be, we'll be safe from uh, any intrusions this time. So high property prices uh, combined with low incomes have left many people without access to adequate housing. To everyone that's on Zoom and to those that are watching us on Facebook Live. Uh, I'm just going to Policies see if I can turn uh, down the volume here. Webinar two weeks ago. So I'm getting our, feedback, so it's a little bit distracting. OK, well, I'll look at that afterwards. Um, so the demand for affordable housing is growing every day, but market forces and governments are not acting fast enough. By sharing our resources and acting collectively, we can help resolve this problem. Today, our goal is to share experiences of very act various actors in the field of cooperatives and community-led housing so that others can learn about different initiatives and approaches um, and bring these ideas to life in their own communities. We're also going to talk about forming regional networks to increase capacity, learn from one another and exchange ideas to allow people to bypass private developers, to build strength in numbers, to raise finance collectively and to become mutual homeowners. This webinar is a conversation with cooperators and project managers developing cooperative and community-led housing in Europe and beyond. Some are working to develop co-op housing for students and others for young adults and families. They'll share their experiences and knowledge related to innovative financing models, the benefits of creating a regional network and the challenges of developing a housing cooperative based on collective ownership in Central and Eastern Europe. So I'm just going to go through a few housekeeping items. So for those that are participating on Zoom, you can post your questions in the, uh, the Q&A section. There's a, a little symbol at the bottom of your screen so you can and you can add your set your questions there. And for those watching on Facebook, you can ask your questions in the comments section. Um, and if you have a question that's directed at a particular panelist, uh, if you can specify that as well, that would be great. Or if it's just a general question, you can just uh, ask away. So we'll do our best to answer all the questions. Um, but if we don't get through all of them, we'll post uh, an FAQ on our website, and uh, and then we'll you know we'll try to answer all of those questions as soon as possible after the the webinar. Um, so um, we are recording the session, and we'll share the link uh, of the recording afterwards, and we'll also send you an evaluation to to fill out just to get uh, some feedback so that we can improve our webinars uh, the next time. So just a little bit about um, Cooperative Housing International. Uh, my name is Julie Lapalm and I'm the Secretary General with CHI. Um, we are one of the eight sectoral organizations of the International Cooperative Alliance, which is the, uh, the apex body representing all types of cooperatives uh, at the international level. We have members from over 30 countries and um, we promote, our, our, our main goal is to promote cooperative housing as an economic and social solution to adequate housing. CHI raises awareness about cooperative housing by promoting its successes on a global level. We facilitate networking opportunities among existing and upcoming cooperative leaders via panel discussions, roundtables, webinars like this one, and symposiums. By highlighting good practices from around the globe and discussing key issues and ensuring that cooperative housing remains an innovative and flexible housing models, um, model that is adaptable to local housing needs. Uh, we are helping to spread um, the, the knowledge and the expertise of uh, what it takes to develop cooperative housing. So today we're joined by uh, an international panel with people from different European cities. Uh, we have uh, Zuzi in Hungary, we have uh, uh, 
Gerte in L London, uh, Hans in Zurich, and uh, Lea in Geneva, and Bea in Marseille. So I'll let each panelist do a brief introduction of themselves. And, uh, and then we'll start with, uh, with Zuzi in Budapest. So welcome, Zuzi. Hello, well, welcome everyone to this uh, webinar. So my name is uh, Zuzi Porsche and I'm based in Budapest in Hungary. Um, and uh, I've been um, working on housing issues and specifically on, on topics of housing finance, both in, uh, um, in, in practical terms and, and also doing research about, about these issues. And uh, I'm one of the founding members of uh, a small independent uh, think tank called Periferia Policy and Research Center. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm also a member of an informal network here in Hungary that's called Rakotsi Collectiva, which, um, which is a, a group uh, working on establishing a model for, for rental housing cooperatives in Hungary um, since around 2012-13. And I also live in the first house established by this network. And, uh, and through this, I am um, also a, a member and an active participant of a mobile housing network, which is um, a regional Eastern European network of pioneering housing cooperatives, where we are um, developing this uh, new kind of model for the region. Thanks. The next person can go. So maybe I'll just jump in. So I'm, my name is Bea, um, I'm based in France. I'm a project manager um, at Urbamond. Urbamond is a small um, association NGO working on promoting community-led housing um, locally in Switzerland and in France, but also internationally for diverse um, cooperation projects. And we mainly work um, on, well, supporting local housing organizations, community-based organizations in different um, contexts on their um, yeah, housing and habitat project, but also working on several um, different tools in terms of finance, in terms of documentation, that some of which we will be presenting today. So looking forward to that. Yeah, maybe I'll go next. Um... Yeah, so welcome everyone and I'm very glad to take part in this webinar. Uh, my name is Gauthier. Uh, I work with uh, several organizations in the UK on trying to expand the use of the housing co-op model in order to deliver uh, perma permanently affordable occupant control and, and non-speculative housing. Um, so I work with uh, an organization called Catalyst Collective to provide support and advice to housing co-op groups and community-led housing hubs, particularly on uh, financial mechanisms and legal structure. Um, and I also work with uh, Cooperatives UK uh, on developing a national federation for uh, student housing co-ops. And also with uh, the Radical Roots Network um, to operate a loan fund to support and help housing uh, housing co-op to get uh, finance. I have a very strong interest in network and federate structures uh, to facilitate the sharing of resources between housing co-ops in order to grow um, this type of housing. Thank you, Gauthier. Uh, Hans? Yeah, I'm Hans from Zurich. Uh, my main responsibility is CEO of ABZ which is Switzerland's largest housing cooperative with over 5,000 flats and 12,000 people living with us. Um, we have 90 employees. ABZ is well known for building high quality, sustainable and affordable living spaces in Zurich, in the Zurich region. And I also serve on the boards of Cooperative Housing International of the Federation of Housing Coops in the Zurich region and the ID Cooperative, the competence center for cooperatives in Switzerland. Okay, I think it's my turn. Um, my name is uh, Lea Oswald. I'm Bea's colleague. I'm a project manager for the NGO Urbamond, but um, the one which is based in Geneva, Switzerland. 
I'm in charge of international cooperation projects in Latin America and Asia in the field of community-led housing and social production of habitat um, with a special focus on the housing cooperative model. I am also coordinating the cohabitat network, uh, facilitating experience exchanges internationally and um, participating in the development of documentation and financial tools, as Bea mentioned, to support community-led housing initiatives. And I am also personally involved in housing cooperative projects here in Geneva. All right. Thanks, everyone. And Bree, do you want to just uh, briefly introduce yourself? Okay. Um, hi, I'm uh, Bree. I am a summer intern for CHI, and I'm currently studying the architectural technology in Algonquin here in Ottawa, Canada. So usually I just do the communication. So like the social media, uh, website updates, any like graphics for CHI. But today I'll just be working in the background, working the slides for this webinar. Thank you, Bree. All right, so our, our first question is a, a general question that um, is directed at each of our panelists. So if you could, uh, uh, provide uh, a quick two minute reply to, um, you know, what is your personal motivation for joining and uh, for being involved in, in cooperative housing? So we'll start with, uh, with Hans, if you can launch us. Hey Brie, kudos for the best background of today's. Uh, <laughs> Um, housing is a secondary human right, and I strongly believe that affordable housing should be available everywhere and to everyone. Nevertheless, governments uh, leave the support too often to the commercial market alone. And corporates provide democratic form of self-organization to rebalance housing supply, not just in Zurich or in Switzerland, worldwide. Therefore, I engage in promoting the idea, bringing people together and sharing knowledge in order to increase the number of people worldwide that have access to affordable housing. Thank you, Hans. Bea, do you want to go next? Yeah, maybe my entry point to this housing related world is a bit more, let's say, pragmatic. So when I um, arrived in Geneva, one of the most expensive cities, I guess, in Europe or in the world, maybe. Um, I was a student, I was a foreign student, and basically um, the housing cooperative, the student co-op in Geneva provided a, uh, a great alternative for housing myself uh, for the time I, I was studying there. Um, so, and that combined with the fact that I met Urba Mond um, at their offices in Geneva back then, kind of, um, yeah, just uh, sparked my interest in, in these community led housing developments, both professionally for my studies, but also at a very personal level. Thank you, Bea. And Leia? Yeah, I think I, I joined Bea on the pragmatic entry point to the housing cooperative model. It was actually my very personal experience when I arrived in Geneva and was looking for some affordable um, housing. And as a student, it is actually very complicated. So uh, luckily I found a room with a housing cooperative for students and I lived there for six years. And that's how I actually learned about this housing model. And before I even joined Urban Monde. And um, when I finished my studies, actually we decided with some of my housemates uh, to continue this adventure. And then we created an association defending the same values of solidarity, democratic and participative processes, um, cultural and social diversity, and also ecological principles that were very important to us. And with this association, we formed a few years ago a housing co-op, and we are now building our first um, project. So I think my personal motivations are linked to the values I just mentioned, but also because uh, I think this model defends some very basic aspects to solve the lack of access to adequate and affordable housing like uh, Hans mentioned it and um, I think uh, it also um, well one of these basic aspects is really collective ownership and um, better building quality that I think is really interesting and it also creates a great environment for creativity and it strengthens the social links. 
Thank you, Leah. And we'll go to London, to Gauthier. Yes. Um, so I suppose um, my personal motivation are kind of two, two sided. Um, the first is really because I believe the housing co-op model uh, can provide a real solution to like the housing crisis um, and to kind of provide uh, permanently affordable homes controlled by people who live in it, uh, which is the problem we see with the normal private market where uh, houses is becoming more unaffordable and also are then usually controlled by a landlord if people can only uh, be renting. Um, although I do believe that these aims uh, that I pursue with housing co-ops are only achievable um, if you can really take houses out of the market and out of the um, out of um, them becoming like financial investment to pursue like profit maximization and therefore um, I'm looking specifically at particular housing co-op model specifically the, the rented um, version of, of housing co-ops which I believe um, are more suited to achieve that compared to other forms of like co-ownership, which you can find in, in other types of housing co-ops. Uh, the second reason is a bit more strategic uh, and is to do with the fact that I think real estate is like a major play player in the economy and access to housing imposes very big constraint on people's lives. And therefore uh, transforming the housing sector can really provide like a strong basis to leverage much broader uh, social economic change, which humanity urgently needs really. So it's like, I think housing co-ops can provide better housing, but can also be actually, can play like a key role in, in broader um, change that, that we need to see in the world. Great, thank you, Gauthier. And Zuzi, your turn. Mm, well, my motivations are also both uh, personal and professional in, in this field. Um, like first in terms of the more like abstractly political or professional uh, motivations. Uh, here in Hungary, I, I started building up a frustration over the over years of being involved in housing issues and housing movements that there is uh, practically no state intervention in providing affordable housing and that's something that is quite systematic for uh, for for Eastern European countries or any other country with, I know, states that have uh, relatively few resources. And, uh, and so I think the model of cooperative housing is also especially interesting in places with uh, these kind of lacking state resources because it can, it can provide an alternative that is affordable and economically viable without having to invest massive um, public resources. And, and it kind of gets you out of this position where you're constantly demanding for something without ever getting a political response and so you kind of you can you can start building something um, yourself uh, on the sidelines and then uh, my city Budapest it's uh, it has experienced like uh, very extreme house price increases in the past years and there's a completely uh, unregulated rental market as well <clears throat> so rental prices have increased even more and and uh, house prices in Hungary were well the the year on year increase has been the highest um, in the whole of Europe since 2016 uh, every year so so you can really see that there is this uh, quite urgent need for for developing new models of, of rental housing and affordable rental housing more more uh, specifically um, and and then on on a personal scale of course this also affects me like how how i can house myself or people uh, that i see around myself and uh, so managing to to establish uh, this first house was of course also a, a a very big improvement in my own housing situation compared to the to the to the very vulnerable position of um, that renting on the market means in in hungary and with much nicer living conditions beside the affordability and the, and the stableness of this construction. Thank you, Zuzi. So interesting to hear the, the different motivations, uh, a few of them motivated by, you know, the personal need to, to, to you know, be housed affordably and uh, you know and also you know beyond that you know like wanting to to be part of a of a community 
and, and, and you know, non-speculative housing. So, um, so Bea, after hearing these different introductions, what, um, what do you see as being common to, to these experiences? Do you, can you share some of your, your reflections on, on the different backgrounds that we've just heard? Um, yeah, it's a bit like, as you said, so it's it's also something that we perceive for our work for the Cohabitat Network, which brings together not only um, European actors, but also um, housing initiatives from across the world that um, basically the individual journeys or personal journeys that lead to, to different housing solutions are very diverse, but um, there are some shared values of like, you know, we, as you said, we heard about collective ownership, creating social links, um, and taking ownership really of the housing process. Um, and uh, what is interesting is also to see like today we're talking about cooperative housing, but broader than that, basically these, um, you know, the, the sum of these individual and collective experiences, some of which we will be hearing uh, of today, really linked to this broader movement that uh, reclaims the role of citizens in, in the urban fabric, but Gucci also mentioned, uh, besides that also really um, claim a transformation in the economic system um, that is at the basis of, of some of the problems that we heard. So yes, these are some of the ideas that, that um, I'd like to share with you or that we, we um, have in mind uh, on the work on with the Cohabitat Network and it is um, in the background of these experiences. So you, you wanted to share the Cohabitat? Um... I think we can talk about that later. Um, yeah, yeah. I'd suggest yeah, and then we jump can... into the... <laughs> yeah. yeah, we'll, we'll show that, uh, we'll, we'll show the yeah. website uh, a little bit later. So, um, so Zuzi, you're based in Hungary and uh, with you know skyrocketing skyrocketing prices, uh, which is something that most cities are are seeing. You know we see that in in London, in New York, San Francisco. Um, you know you can just name any city and 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 we have very similar problems with affordability and and access. So what challenges are are you facing? you know, in a country and region where cooperative housing is not a well-known housing solution, you know, and not supported financially and institutionally, how, how did you go about, you know, setting up a housing cooperative in, in this kind of environment? Yes, well, and uh, it, it, it really counts a lot, the fact that there is no established uh, legal and financial structure for, for these kind of housing projects. and. So that kind of creates an extra challenge at, uh, at every step. And it also means that we're in a situation where we have to kind of build a pilot and build a model and work on a, on a broader institutional and financial structure at the same time. So like constantly kind of um, um, working on these, on these different scales. And uh, so I think the biggest challenge is, uh, is the financial one, um, because if there would be a, um, stable and reliable financial channel that new projects just have to turn to, then that would significantly accelerate the development of the model. And um, so in our case, and yeah, what's important to maybe for, for the participants also to know that there is a structural difficulty in, in um, Eastern Europe that there are no, uh, no ethical banks or banks that would provide loans for these kind of projects and and even the individual lending environment or one that is available to to enterprises is um, <clears throat> uh, gives access only to loans and on much worse conditions than than what is the standard in uh, in western europe and i know germany or in switzerland in terms of interest rates or or, or loan conditions in general and so in our case, we didn't even, we weren't even able to secure a bank loan because they kind of, you fall in between this, this thing of, of uh, well, you, you're, you, you don't want individual loans for individual households and you don't want a two, three year project loan that uh, real estate developers would be using and then they can't really, uh, they don't have this kind of product or they don't really understand what you want. Um, and uh, so in the end, um, this situation, situation kind of um, forces you to rely a lot more on community resources, both financially and also in terms of, of um, all the other work that needs to be done. 
Uh, and so the first house was uh, was realized with this kind of crowd financing structure with a lot of uh, small loans or small investments that we pay interest on. Um, and so it's actually a, a broader community supporting this whole project and supporting the development of the project, which is actually a, a, a very nice model and and it's an innovation that that should be kept and even though it was it was uh, we came to this by um, well, because we didn't really have other options, um, but um, but in order to to upscale faster, I think we need some bigger institutional resources that uh, that we are working on developing um, constantly, and and then the same thing is true in um, in legal terms that there is no um, legal form that would exactly match what we are trying to do, because it's something that needs to be economically viable, but at the same time, also secure uh, community control. And so now actually we are, um, actually a lot of lot of structures of um, community-led housing have some kind of a hybrid legal structure. And so that's also what we are working towards uh, where there's an economic entity and also this uh, membership-based um, uh, other entity that 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 controls the economic entity, um, but it's 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 tricky to to develop these. So it's kind of like um, it's a learning process, um, and uh, so it's a uh, it's uh, yeah, and then it's a learning process while developing your own uh, your own housing and also a broader model that will then be able to be used by by other groups and and uh, other people as well. And uh, and maybe it's also an important distinction to make that uh, Gautier was also saying that we are also uh, working on a rental based model for housing cooperatives because uh, that's what we see as most accessible because one of the important problems is a lack of equity of, um, for people who, who don't have access to, to secure housing and so we're trying to get around that but that also means that we need more external resources and, and so it's kind of yeah, well, it's a, it's it's this learning process where we always go one one step further or one scale higher in every in every round. So um, let's. I, I just want to follow up on on what you were talking about, Zuzi. Um, you're part of a, a group called MOBA, um, and congratulations on it becoming a European Cooperative Society uh, just a few months ago, I believe. So this is a big step um, you know, for, your, for your group and a big step towards making uh, a network uh, you know, capable of attracting and operating funds you know, uh, as a result, a revolving fund. So can you tell us um, why you and the other group members created uh, MOBA and can you tell us how you found one another and a bit about about your journey? Yes. Uh, so MOBA Housing Network is a um, MOBA Housing European Cooperative Society now by its official name is a is a network of, of different Eastern European groups and um, how we found each other one of the main reasons why we came together initially this whole thing started in 2017 was uh, strongly linked to this uh, these structural limitations of access to finance that i was mentioning before in for our particular case but it's something that all the other groups were uh, experiencing as well um, and uh, and so and, and also the lack of institutional recognition or lack of of uh, previously existing examples so we came together, these five, five different groups from five different Eastern European countries, um, from the Czech Republic, Hungary, Serbia, Croatia, and uh, Slovenia. And, uh, and we are all in a quite similar position of, of uh, doing the model development and developing pilot projects. Uh, yeah, so now on the screen, you can see the, the five uh, fa founding members of MOBA and then listed uh, the supporting members uh, where you can see Urbamund and World Habitat as well as, and, uh, and some other institutions that are more linked to the financial aspect. And uh, so one of the aims is to, uh, is to be bigger together, basically, because, uh, because we are all small and uh, in our local context and trying to achieve something that doesn't exist yet. And so we figure that if we, if we, if we come together, um, we can be stronger and uh, which is important also towards external actors 
that means uh, towards larger financial actors, for example, together we can show a certain volume um, that, uh, that can be sufficient. Uh, and also we can, uh, we can have access to, to other bigger uh, partners uh, if we are joined together in this way. Uh, and then, that, well, that is towards the international scale and then towards the local scale, we can also strengthen each other's position if we are together in this network, because then we will not seem like these, I know, strange little local pioneering groups in the face of our local politicians of our, our local um, um, financial stakeholders, um, but we will be able to use the know-how of this broader network and the weight of this broader network in our, in our local um, work as well. And uh, so what we have been doing since 2017, there are very regular meetings every few months uh, where we develop our institutional vision and where we develop the, the kind of internal services uh, that we want to provide for our members. And these include, I don't know, a business plan template or, or um, support with the legal structure that local groups uh, should develop. So there's this um, uh, capacity building support towards the local level, and then also um, an effort of harmonizing all the different local projects and uh, kind of for them to, to be able to work as a package towards external partners, external financial or partners or, or others. And, uh, and so in this process, as Julie mentioned, there was an important step uh, at the end of February this year when we established MOBA as a European Cooperative Society, which is a transnational legal entity. Um, so it is very um, well suited for what we want to do, actually. And within this European Cooperative Society, we started setting up a, a revolving fund, um, which, um, which will give uh, loans to the members of uh, MOBA. And, uh, and that's why well, we will talk about the fund a bit more later on, I think. Thank you, Zuzi. So just to continue on, on that theme of, uh, of regional networks. Um, so by forming regional networks and, and collaborating, all of you have experienced the power of, of networking and, and neutralizing resources and, and knowledge. So what lessons have you learned from this networking, both inside and outside your countries and do you have any advice on you know like how to set up a network in your region because we we do have one question from one of our attendees uh, about you know uh, setting up regional networks and I think it's important for people to um, you know to understand you know some of the you know the, the basics of you know what it takes to set up a regional network uh, you know and, and where should that impetus come from so let's start with with Gautier. Um, yes, yeah, so I mean, following from what Juju said, um, to, to some extent, like definitely uh, networks play a, a major role in, in bringing cohesion um, to the sector and also to support groups so they don't have to reinvent the wheel all the time. Um, and also it definitely helps to build like strong, a stronger voice um, for either lobbying or access to finance. Uh, so I, I, I would say like they, they're really key. Uh, to the success of um, of being able to kind of spread the the housing co-op model, this is something the UK has actually um, is a bit lacking, uh, or at least has been has been lacking for, for quite a while. Um, we have, I suppose, uh, two main uh, networks which are national. Uh, one is the co co uh, Confederation of Cooperative Housing, which has been established for a while, which has a lot of uh, very large housing co-ops, which have been mainly funded by the state. Um, and the other is uh, Radical Roots, which has been more independently set up by, um, by uh, small independent housing co-ops, and which provides a range of uh, resources, financial tools, legal support, um, and, and supports with lobbying as well. Um, I suppose we uh, we still have a, a lack of infrastructure um, and, and network in terms of sharing financial resource, uh, and that's something we are uh, working on at the moment. Uh, in terms of why do you need to set up uh, a network to, to address the question? I mean, 
often what, what I've seen anyway, that it has come from um, individual groups or projects who kind of saw the need to federate um, to achieve a particular goal. So currently, for example, we are working with a few different uh, housing co-ops who want to pull their financial resource together. And we're trying to set up a network which is mainly to do with, with finances. So we're sort of separating. There's a lot of small kind of regional uh, organization now which have been set up for like uh, res uh, like knowledge-based resource. Um, but now we want to set up networks for, um, for pulling financial resource together. Uh, and so I think it comes from um, basically kind of individual units or groups um, wanting to address a particular barrier and, and see the need to, to, to federate and how federating can help them overcome uh, a difficulty that they are facing. Great, thank you, Gauthier. Uh, Hans, do you want to jump in? Yes, thanks, Julie. Well, in, in Zurich, uh, key to the high number of affordable housing, which is approximately 25% of all housing stock, uh, is the acceptance across almost all political parties and also among commercial investors. And also key is a political systems where people can vote on, on issues. So that's what they did. And they voted to increase the percentage of affordable housing up to 33% over the next 15 years. But this is probably well known to, to all of you. So um, I'd like to talk about uh, Meros Wohnen. Uh, this is also a well-known cooperative project in northern area of Zurich. And it's remarkable for my opinion, two reasons. First is when the town of Zurich approached the cooperative movement with the idea of developing a project in northern, the north of Zurich, not one cooperative was willing to take the risk and develop the project by itself or alone. And only when a group of cooperatives of all sizes got together and agreed to share the risks, the project took off. And it really took off. Uh, once uh, an umbrella cooperative was set up, which covered for the risks, people started to develop ideas and the energy that was unleashed took the pro project finally to a successful, successful end or um, uh, a successful start, depending on how you look at it. So cooperating between different legal entities increases the size and the, uh, and the complexity that, that can be mastered by this uh, entity, but it doesn't come for free. That's uh, uh, something I uh, always like to talk about. Um, there's a need to be, a, to a strong common shared vision if you cooperate among entities and resource to guide and coordinate and align the different partners. And Meryl Swannon did a great job on that. Yeah, it is. Uh, we had the chance to visit it four years ago and it was pretty impressive. Uh, Leah, would you like to, uh, to add some context to this as well? Um, yeah, maybe from Urbamond's point of view, um, I think our main concern has always been to promote experience exchanges on a large scale and to participate in, give, in giving better visibility to all the inspiring community-led housing initiatives, um, including the housing cooperative model that exists around the world. So um, actually to this end, we started in 2014 uh, by organizing a forum that with some of the major um, grassroots organizations and federations and networks um, that promote or implement community-led housing uh, projects in different regions of the world, like Slum Dollars International or um, the Asian Coalition for Housing Rights, Habitat International Coalition or the CLT Network, uh, as well as with academic actors and uh, other international organizations like Cooperative Housing International or World Habitat. So this shows um, many organizations or federations or networks that already exist, that already are doing an important job of um, advocacy, of promoting the models, of um, giving more visibility and uh, strengthening um, experience exchanges um, and the global movement. Uh, overall. So the aim of this first reunion in 2014 was to discuss how to actually coordinate 
all the efforts of all these different actors and to um, formulate action plans and to create this global movement for community-led housing um, and social production of habitat to respond together to the common challenges grassroots communities are facing to implement their um, right to adequate housing through their participative processes. And um, actually this initiative uh, that we started in 2014 became officially the Cohabitat Network in 2018. So we have defined with all these organizations some common strategic focus points to work on together like the documentation of uh, projects to give more visibility on an international level, but also national levels and regional levels um, to facilitate peer-to-peer -peer exchange, uh, experience exchanges between um, community-led housing projects, to share their experiences, to inspire new projects, and to develop also um, different tools like solidarity-based financial tools and mechanisms to support this um, greater challenge that is uh, access to affordable finance. So actually over the past few years, we have organized various activities jointly with the Cohabitat Network partners in different regions, like uh, regional meetings, um, peer exchanges, field visits, awards. We have also been developing an open data and collaborative database to document community-led housing projects online. Um, and today, uh, one of the main reflection is oriented on the access um, to affordable finance that we already mentioned, and which is really one of the main challenges for the community, and how to develop jointly some tools and mechanisms or general strategies and collaborations in response to this specific challenge, um, not only um, on a local uh, level, but really internationally, and to promote this international solidarity. Um, so I would say that the lessons learned from um, for Upamont from these collaborations through the network during the last years are that um, mutualizing efforts and collective um, thinking to find common solutions to the challenges that all inhabitants groups are facing uh, in implementing their projects is really fundamental. So we have seen from various examples how experience exchanges and access to information, for example, no matter the context, can inspire new projects and new solutions. And uh, one uh, really interesting example is um, in Switzerland, uh, between the two cantons, uh, between Zurich uh, and Hans know what I'm speaking about, and the Geneva housing cooperatives, uh, which actually found their inspiration in the Zurich housing cooperatives. But I, I mean, there are also many examples of um, experience exchanges between uh, countries or regions, and I, I will present one more um, a bit later. Thank you, Leah. So I, uh, I just want to take a moment to uh, share some of the questions that are, have been coming in. And I also want to remind viewers that we are recording this session and we will be sharing it uh, afterwards with uh, anyone who, uh, who wants to you know, watch it again or, or share it with someone who, uh, who can attend our webinar. So we have a question from Gregory Carlson, who is from the National Association of Housing Cooperatives in the US. And he says, funding is key to cooperative housing. Is most of your development government funding, uh, private funding, or is it a mixture of both? I think it varies from, uh, from country to country and, and from panelist to panelist. Uh, Hans, do you want to uh, take a, a shot at, uh, at explaining how ABZ's uh, settlements are, are funded? Thanks, Julia. Um, it's probably not applicable to, to everybody because uh, we have a 100 year old uh, settlements uh, which we can finance on. So uh, in general speaking, I say that uh, it's a mixed answer uh, because if we all agree that um, housing, uh, housing market is not a functional market, it's uh, at least partially uh, failing. And if you say that um, uh, we need regulations and when we see say regulations, uh, it's the, the state that has to provide uh, for, for, for these regulations and part of it should be access to, to affordable financing for, for uh, cooperatives. In Zurich, this is done by the uh, pension fund of, of the town of Zurich. 
they give uh, loans, uh, cheap loans, um, uh, and help to finance the long end uh, where you don't have your, your own money, but I uh, probably can talk about it later on. Uh, uh, the other one is, uh, the, the other means um, that's uh, financing uh, from, from cooperatives is uh, from the people living in the cooperatives because uh, they are uh, were lucky enough to, to have a flat, to have access to, to affordable housing. And in ABZ, uh, we uh, collect five francs or like five dollars a month uh, of the of the rent to put in in a fund uh, in order to to further finance projects like MOBA. We were lucky to to, to be able to to finance MOBA. So this is a kind of a solidarity aspect that goes beyond if you have a flat and forget it, but uh, to continue. So it's both. It's a mixture of both. Anyone else want to jump in uh, on answering this question? Yeah, maybe just briefly that um, we don't have any public resources and are not very hopeful of <laughs> being able to secure any. Um, so we, yes, like Hans said, actually, we are also relying a lot on, on um, member contributions at the moment as well. And, um, and then, well, this crowd financing that I was talking about, and then the broader financial structure that we are currently working on and developing would would rely mainly on uh, on private or semi-private type of resources and even on the scale of MOBA. Um, we, we think, well, of course, if we have donations like uh, like the support we received from ABZ that that makes uh, things uh, easier, but uh, but we are developing a mechanism which is which would be able to accommodate um, market resources and uh, paying an interest on it because we think that even if like if if you do develop these kind of structures in a in a nonprofit way or you don't uh, aim for it, accumulating a lot of resources, then then actually you can still keep rents affordable while paying while paying interest um, on, on your resources if, if they are relatively low or acceptable. Mm -hmm. We have a question on uh, Facebook from uh, Jeanne Booth, who says she's interested in uh, housing co-ops that also share workspace, business space, studios, or, or shops. Um, are there any examples um, that, she can, that she can look at? Maybe Hans can say a few words about more than housing, as Wunen, which is basically developing whole neighborhoods, not just housing. Me again, sorry. Um, well, um, during uh, most of the last century, it was believed that housing and um, shops and working should be segregated in, in towns. And this, uh, uh, this belief uh, luckily has come to an end. So. We now believe that uh, housing and working should be close together, let's say in walking distance, because then you also avoid a lot of the um, problems with, with traffic. So all of the new settlements in Zurich, or at least most of them, include uh, shops, workspace of all kinds on the basement, on the basement layer, on the ground floor. Uh, um, which is uh, which is great because uh, there's there's life during during the day because people go to the shops and uh, uh, work there, but it's also a risk for the cooperatives because as we as we have seen the, the last couple of months, uh, if this peop uh, if these uh, shops or or businesses close down, you you lose the rent. So it's kind of a mixed bag. Uh, we believe that from from a town development perspective, yes, there should be a mixture. Uh, but there's also a, a big risk in it. But um, we, we, we go forward because we also believe it's uh, very, very great uh, in, in handling other ecological issues like um, like the, the, the traffic issue when you can walk from where you live to where you work. Mm -hmm. And maybe just a thought on, you know, like if you look at other contexts, I guess the separation between private space and commercial space is uh, very much of a, let's say, uh, well, limited to some countries, Switzerland, to Euro, to European context, maybe, but I guess in, in, I mean, in many countries, the separation doesn't really exist, where the living space is also space for income generating activities. So 
Um, and I think more generally, these community housing initiatives, they speak for, for this idea of reclaiming really the role of the citizens and shaping their neighborhoods and shaping not only their homes, but really also at the neighborhood scale. And this is something that, um, while many movements recently are also really expressing in that sense of like, preserving, um, securing uh, affordable housing, but also affordable land for um, community-led neighborhood development. So I think those are intrinsically linked. Actually. Yeah, and yeah maybe I can jump in. Oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead, uh, Gauthier. I mean, I would just jump in very quickly just to give a couple of examples of such developments which are happening in the UK. So if people want to just look at our website, they can find uh, some info, but there's something called the Sturchley Cooperative Development in Birmingham, which is actually uh, set up exactly to do that. So it's a mix of uh, housing and shops, and it's uh, so it's a housing co-op with a few workers co-ops developing together. Um, and there's also something in London called uh, Community Asset for, so for Society and Housing, uh, which is a community land trust, but which intends to uh, also do a mixed development with housing, workspaces, and community spaces. So I can maybe post the link on the chat so people can um, access the information they're looking at. Yeah, that'd be it. great. And then I can, I can post it on uh, the Facebook uh, comments as well. All right, so we will uh, move along uh, and take some questions a little bit later. So, um, so access to affordable finance and financial mechanisms is a, a common challenge for igniting and, and scaling cooperative housing in many regions. Gauthier, can you tell us a little bit more about the Student Cooperative Homes, the, the UK Federation of, of Student Housing Co-ops and the community share offer that raised over 300,000 pounds for buying properties to house students uh, throughout the UK? Sure, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I'm very much happy to talk about it. Um, uh, firstly, I would just like to, uh, I suppose, explain quickly about the, the financing or the different type of finance, because I think that might make it clearer. Um, so in a sense, there is kind of four main sources of finance uh, for, for housing core projects. Uh, one which is quite a major one is, is loans from financial institutions. And um, and usually plays yeah a big part of the financing, but it can be quite expensive, um, and it usually requires a deposit. So it requires the co-op to put some capital in, so the bank doesn't fund all of it. Um, then funding can come from the state, um, but, and that again can play a big role in in making the project affordable. But funding is not always there, and it can also be. Um, there can also be some strings attached to it, uh, which, which might make it tricky for the project to access. Um, then money can come from the members themselves, so the kind of the future tenants. Um, and while that can uh, play also a role, the project we're trying to develop here is uh, like trying to make sure that that's not compulsory, that um, in general, um, you know, we don't want members to have to put a large amount of capital into the project because obviously that's going to rule out a, a big part of the population that may not have capital. Um, and so the other one is uh, trying to raise investment from the bro broader, from the public, yeah, from the broader population. Um, and one caveat here is that uh, depending on the type of investment you, you, you raise, that might also come with uh, decision-making power um, if people invest equity. Uh, for example, so uh, and and we try to limit that because we want models which uh, are where the houses are controlled by people who live in it by tenants. Um, so uh, so the idea and and that's what we did with student cooperative homes is try to find a way of flexible ways to raise investment from the public but without compromising on on democratic user control on the control from the occupants. Um, so student co-op homes is a like a newly set up uh, fed, national federation for uh, student housing co-ops and student housing co-ops particularly face challenges to access uh, finance um, and loan finance or, or other kind of finance uh, on their own basically when they're just one group um, so they came together to set up this federation that would act as a more long-standing body um, and that would support them to uh, raise finance to purchase houses 
um, for them uh, so they could listen to them and, and, and get house. Um, so Student Core Homes did a first, what, what we call in the UK, community share issue. So uh, basically raising shares from the public and we've raised 300,000 uh, pounds. Uh, now that's sort of just a, a, a small first step uh, to demonstrate the viability of the model. And we, we intend to raise uh, much more uh, in the future. Um, but still, that will allow us to um, to create two more uh, student housing co-op in the UK. Um, yes, yeah, so the way student co-op homes work is that uh, it raises finance from the public. It gets uh, a mortgage from a financial institution, purchase properties, lease those properties to uh, the housing co-op uh, group, and then the co-op pay rents to student co-op homes um, and this rent is then used to finance further acquisition. So in a sense, the, the, the model sort of builds some kind of autonomy and, and resilience in a, in a few different ways. So um, it, the, the governance is, is what we call like a multi-stakeholder co-op, meaning there's different type of members which have different decision-making power. So the uh, users, which are the housing co-ops themselves, the ones that are being housed, have got most of the decision-making power and the investors uh, who have put the, the, the capital in get um, some return on their investment. Um, so, you know, get, get capital return um, and get a, some decision-making power, but less than, than the users. Um, and then the other idea is that the Federation, as it keeps acquiring properties, it builds like a strong um, assets portfolio and a debt record, uh, which then makes it easier to access uh, more finance, either from lending institution or even from uh, other investors. Um, it also is um, getting rental income in perpetuity, uh, which means that over time, again, it, um, it builds its own uh, capital reserve to be able to further finance new acquisition uh, and, and more and more autonomously uh, from uh, other, you know, from a dependency from other investments, um, basically. So, I mean, we were very glad to be able to raise uh, and to have a successful first share offer to kind of kickstart um, the kickstart the federation. And I think uh, this is kind of a new setup in the, in the UK. So it's, a, it's a type of federation which both combine the kind of promoting uh, a movement, so we promote student co-ops, we support the groups, but we also mutualize finance from all of the, the housing co-op projects which are being set up through this federation. Okay, um, thank you. Can, can you, you're also involved with, uh, with Radical Roots. Can you tell us a little bit more um, about that? Yes, um, so Radical Roots does something a little bit different. Um, it's also a national federation. The members are also housing co-ops, although this is not for students, it is for um, you know, any, any kind of housing co-ops. Um, and um, so Radical Roots produce um, resources and, and, and again support groups wanting to set up co-ops, but also runs a loan fund. And this is uh, a loan, so this is basically kind of lending money to housing co-ops so they can uh, put down a deposit for their mortgages. Um, so usually in the UK, the banks will provide up to about 80% of the property price. So the group needs to find the remaining 20% plus extra costs um, associated with the purchase. Uh, and so that's where they would come to Radical Roots, try to get a long-term loan and also raise other private loans from the public. Um, and uh, the way Radical Roots operates its loan mechanism is a little bit particular because again, there was this desire to limit the, as well, limit the, the, the power of finance. So it actually has set up a sister organization called Rootstock, and uh, the public invests into Rootstock, not into Radical Roots directly. And so you can buy shares into Rootstock, and you, you can get an interest rate. You can choose your interest rate up to a certain limit. Um, so again, investors can uh, you know, receive like a, a financial return um, and they all get uh, one vote. So every investor gets one vote into Rootstock. So in a sense, it is like a co-op, it's one member, one vote. 
Um, but then Rootstock invest all of that all of that money that's being raised uh, from the public into radical roots, uh, meaning that Rootstock and the whole pool of investors has got only one vote into radical roots. Okay, and then radical roots loan uh, that money that's being raised from uh, investors into the into its member co-ops in the form of long-term loans. Then the money is being paid back by the members into Radical Roots, so Radical Roots replenishes the fund and can lend more money over time. But again, it's a setup which you know, allows to raise a variety of different types of finance, loans, shares, um, but with always limiting the decision-making power of, of capital, basically. Um, so the loan currently operates at its... Uh, currently uh, revolve about like one million pounds of uh, of capital. Wow, that's a, that's a good pool of money. Okay, right, so um, let's uh, move over to to Zurich again with with Hans and talk about some other solutions that are that are being developed. So ABZ is developing four new housing settlements at the moment, including uh, 174 apartment units uh, next to a, a football stadium and another large building, one, uh, uh, one, one of the largest buildings that ABZ uh, has ever worked on uh, with 180 apartments on the, the Coke site. So Hans, can you tell us about some solutions and mechanisms used by ABZ to develop new settlements? Uh, thanks, Julie. In an increasingly volatile, unpredictable and complex environment, it's key to cooperate in order to mitigate risks, uh, as I mentioned before, and to have all the competences on board to master many challenges. And I'd like to talk about two projects we, we do with this uh, mindset behind. Uh, one is Koch Areal. It's close to the city center in a former industrial area of Zurich that is now being densified. In this big, we plan to invest up to 300 million Swiss francs. And it's also complex to de develop. It has to include low price space for small and medium sized manufacturing businesses. That's also in direct answer to the, the question we had a couple of minutes ago. It has to include a public park and a high rise building in order to achieve the densification goals with affordable housing, of course. And that's a, a, a real challenge for us because uh, high-rise buildings are usually more um, costly than when you uh, build uh, standard settlements. So only the cooperation between two cooperatives for the affordable housing, the town of Zurich for the park, and the commercial investor for the manufacturing businesses brought together the competencies uh, that we needed to master the variety of challenges we, we faced on this area. Or positively said, uh, the four different partners team up and we can really unleash the power of our vision to have affordable housing and affordable uh, manufacturing businesses at the same place in uh, one of the most expensive cities uh, in the world. The second project uh, is the project Hartorm, uh, where ABZ is cooperating with a commercial developer and the pension fund to develop an area with a football stadium, which is actually new to, to, to Switzerland, and two high-rise buildings. It's an interesting project because it failed already two times in the past, um, but we were able to convince the public of the project in a democratic vote. So we won a vote on, on our project. The lesson there is uh, you have to communicate with all the stakeholders and listen to the people living in the neighborhood in order to understand their fears and really addressing their needs. And that's what I often say that over 90% of what I do is communication. And that's true for both projects I was mentioning. Uh, and I was saying it before, managing cooperative development and handling complex situation is actually great as a CEO but it comes at the price. You have to be prepared, bring in the different competencies and you have to spend resources on it. So it's not for free, uh, you have to invest in it. Perfect, thanks Hans. Uh, I'm just uh, fielding uh, some more questions. There's a, a couple that are directed at, at Gautier. 
Um, so about the, the student co-op homes, you know, uh, asking like, why does the student co-op homes have money to buy property? Does the government provide funding for the co-op to purchase property? Where does the loan come from, from the bank? Uh, and who is interested in purchasing the shares and, and where, do you, where do you buy the shares? And who are the members of the co-op? So there's a, a, quite a few there. <laughs> uh, Gautier, do you want to? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, okay, so um, yeah, so so it's not there's no st state funding uh, for this project. It is the um, so the money only come from currently only come from the share investment. Um, and uh, and from the banks. So in in the UK, there is only a handful of banks, and a small hand, in fact, uh, of banks which would um, lend to housing co-ops in general. Uh, they've also uh, been willing to lend for student housing co-op project, which is which is very good. Um, so we partnership with them, uh, or we partnering with them uh, to um, to finance our projects. Um, so the so basically the deposit or any extra cost is comes from the share capital, and then the rest come from the banks. Um, now who invest in in student co-op homes? I mean we've sort of uh, did a public share issue, so we've sort of marketed. You know we we did some communication and we created uh, like a business plan and uh, a share offer document which lays out you know the different aspects of the project and the. Um, you know, in the financial forecast and everything, um, and then try to publicize that as far reaching as we could. Um, you know, some of the investment came also from the housing co-op sector or from the broader kind of um, cooperative sectors in general. Um, yeah, so, you know, there would be kind of social investors or people we want to invest in uh, ethical um, type of uh, venture, I suppose. Also, because um in a sense while it's not secured investment but it is um you know we, we are going to purchase uh property assets with with the investment is probably seen as a bit less risky than investing into any new business venture basically um so I'm, i can't remember if i've covered all of the different points but um if there's anything else let me know um yeah and and just to to add to that uh, question from Niall Mulholland, who is the executive member of the London Federation of Housing Co-ops. And he's asking, have you looked at the option that the student co-ops can over time buy out the investors to ensure that the co-op is fully run by, by the students? Um, yeah, I mean, it, it would be possible that, um, that over time, they would have no more need for share capital. Um, and could uh, and and could basically sell back the shares. I mean, yeah, there might be some technical difficulties, but yeah, I mean, there would be ways for um, anyway for not raising any additional shares and then also reduce the incentive for the investors to leave their shares in. Uh, so over time, depending on you know how they how the model grows, there would definitely be possibility for. Um, for buying those investors, but whether that's actually some, the route we want to go down to, it's unclear. Because again, the investors don't have much decision-making power, and they're also supporting us with this. And actually, at the moment, as we see it, there's probably an infinite need of capital when it comes to uh, trying to grow a sector like housing, because you know, obviously, you need a lot of capital to to purchase properties. So, yeah, not, not something we see in the short term, anyway. Yeah. Um... Well, speaking of, uh, of capital, uh, we have um, Miro Benic, who asks about what if a cooperative uh, includes a bank um, as a member with the right to use the flat, you know, maybe the bank would be more willing to offer a low interest rate loan. Uh, what, uh, what do you think about this, this idea? Um, I know that there's, uh, you know, some cooperatives have, uh, have savings, uh, you know, like a savings credit union associated with their, with their cooperatives so that members can um, place their savings in, in that credit union uh, and the, the savings are, are going towards, you know, paying for, uh, for their cooperative home. Is uh, jump into that um, yeah. uh, because there's a possibility, in, at least in Switzerland, uh, that you can 
get money uh, savings from, from your members. It's called Depositenkasse, which is a very interesting in instrument because um, if you do it on a commercial basis, then you would need to have a banking license, which is heavily regulated in Switzerland. Uh, and you would generate a lot of overhead costs and you need a lot of competencies that we don't have as a as a housing cooperative. But uh, with this depositing cost, uh, we get a lot of funds from, from our members. Uh, ABZ has currently over 200 million Swiss francs from, from its members. And we always, and this is a, a very important, we always mention it when we go to the banks, that our members have trust in us and that they should have trust in us as well. But actually banks are, they are fair enough. They, they, they know our business model, they value um, our, our cooperative and they fix the, the rents um, according to their internal valuation and not um, on the height of the, the members contribution to the financing. Okay. Thank you. And another question, I think this one, uh, Zuzi or maybe Bea, um, you could answer this. It's um, uh, Oh, I lost the question. Where did it go? Oh, yeah. So, uh, so this is from uh, Jordi Prados Ole from Spain. Hello, Jordi. We are starting a co-housing project and we'd like to know if you use any sort of software or tool to guide all the process from the group building to the final steps and all the process and which are the most difficult and tedious parts for you. I would pass that question to Bea and Leah because we don't use any software, but maybe the two of you know about some examples for that, but it would be nice, yeah, I, I think, yeah but we should develop those when we haven't yet. But I thought there was, a, I saw a tool on your website, uh, more, maybe it's more for finance. Yeah, yeah for the finances, yeah, yes, for, the for the yeah. group, group building processes, but okay. uh, we have this tool called the, um, for, for building a business plan and the financial structure for the local projects and things that you have to consider in your business plan. And um, yeah, yeah, we have this Excel sheet. You and that's on your website uh, on moba.coop. Yes. Yeah, it's called the Open FRM. So yeah, yeah. I guess um, I mean Juji is the best to speak about the tedious <laughs> parts of this <laughs> process. I guess um, I think um, many of it relate also to you know like how to establish a legal model that works within a context where co-ops are not well known. And I guess in Spain um, you're a step further than maybe the countries in in Eastern Europe, but still it's 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 quite difficult. So. I think one of the, maybe without going into detail into that, but um, one of the main issues or the important issues around this is also to document those processes and to share them across, um, yeah, different contexts, but also mainly in, in one same context. So maybe Juji, you could just very quickly, briefly speak to your process in terms of legal, legal structure and maybe how to share that with upcoming or startup groups so that they don't repeat um, similar tedious <laughs> steps. To get to, to yeah. Yes. Well, I, I think one one of our big difficulties is about scale and the adequate legal structure for the scale. Because, for instance, we came up with this very nice legal structure that was good for uh, attracting investments and attracting the bigger and smaller as well. Um, and then and then a, a membership entity that would control that. But but then it turned out that at our stage at the moment it has so high overhead costs uh, that it would be too much to maintain before we have um, I know more properties involved in it that would have this um, rent and uh, and thus a, a stream of revenue. So I, I guess one of, one of our learnings from, from the whole process and, and then we've been through various uh, legal forms um, and then kind of discovering uh, the, the handicaps of all the different legal forms. And so one, one of our learnings is to kind of um, scale um, gradually as, as your organization grows and, and have like bigger and more expensive and more robust legal structures when, when your organization is also uh, bigger and more robust. And, and the other learning is what, what I mentioned earlier about ha having this hybrid and combined 
structures uh, and not trying to do everything with the same legal entity necessarily. And that's kind of resonates to what Gautier was explaining also about, about rootstock and radical roots and how, how you can kind of su superpose different legal entities that, that have different functions but are connected to each other. All right, thank you, Zuzi. All right, we're gonna move on to uh, a couple more questions uh, from, from our end. So, um, so Bea, you recently worked on the funding application for MOBA to the Employment and Social Innovation Program of the European Union. So what solutions and strategies are you envisioning for MOBA members? And what are some of the next steps that, that you're planning? So, well, yes, one of the things we're um, working on at the moment, uh, or generally with MOBA is, uh, as Juji mentioned, of course, this um, big challenge of the access to affordable finance and as a solution to that, or at least as a, one of the solutions that may um, help scale uh, these different um, emerging housing cooperative uh, experiences in the region is the development or the establishment of what we call the MOBA Housing Development Fund. And basically to set up um, the MOBA housing SC as a sort of a financial intermediary that would capture investment of different sorts um, from different um, sources and kinds of investment into a fund that would be self-managed um, by the MOBA members, um, meaning managed by the cooperatives that are part of, of the MOBA network. Um, and what we try to do is uh, there to bring together basically so the supply of, of funding but or finance uh, and but also to pool the demand. So when Juji introduced the idea of um, MOBA or the reason of why MOBA exists, she said, and I like that expression, we're bigger together. Um, so and I guess the, the issue is that, you know, if you have one like uh, pilot housing experience somewhere in a, in a city, it's not of interest uh, to, you know, to a bank to develop like a credit line or a product or uh, any financial instruments to, to support that group. And um, as we all know, it's very difficult to, um, to fund the housing development um, just by crowdfunding or like, you know, um, these kind of citizen finance tools. Um, and it gets even if possible, of course, to, to scale that experience, which is what we, what we all aim to do. So um, yeah, sort of one of the solutions that we're thinking about is, is this housing development fund. And basically this, well, the specific application without going into detail because it's, it's not of so much interest, but what we want to do is really to set up the, the infrastructure or the legal structure, the operational structure of the fund um, to build the capacities within MOBA to, to operate such a financial instrument, but also at the same time to build um, very concrete links with potential investors, um, funders, um, but also peers. And that's very more important. We will get to that um, in the housing sector to, to attract uh, financing into that fund. Um, yeah, Juju, maybe you want to add to this or... <laughs> Sorry. So just to follow up on my scaling uh, reference from before, that with the with the mobile fund, um, like first we aim to be able to give small loans that can act as a supplement to some kind of a loan by a bigger financial institution, and then um, like further down the line, we hope to be able to to provide loans that are big enough to to finance housing developments in themselves. And um, so, yeah, taking this um, this kind of gradual approach to developing the fund. And another aspect is maybe also what we heard earlier about, like also this well tension, or at least um, maybe two objectives that we have in mind is one: build an efficient financial mechanism that works and that is able to scale these experiences, but at the same time to keep community control over over that um, mechanism. And I guess that's a that's a big challenge, you know, like how do you, how do you get to a level where we also built, um, Hans mentioned these internal capacities um, within a network or within a, a housing initiative to, to deal with these issues of, of financing. And um, earlier we talked about peer learning and exchanges and it's also very important to know that 
um, well, this housing development fund that we're thinking about is very much inspired by experiences that exist in other, in other countries. So just to mention some, you know, the Swiss uh, Solidarity Fund or Revolving Fund that, that is, um, that Hans described a little bit, but also, um, you know, other experiences, just as the Mietshäuser Syndicat, I saw in the chat that someone mentioned it as one of the, um, as a possible financing model but also radical roots and, and different models that were developed in different places. And of course, what is always interesting to see is that in, in countries where people are thinking about like these um, pilot initiatives, they are very really very well aware and informed about what exists in different <laughs> other countries. The challenge is really to, to adapt it to the local context um, first. Yeah, and just a thought on, on, on this international aspect that MOBA is actually also an instrument for us to, to be able to engage in these international networks and solidarity mechanisms in a more meaningful way than if we would do, only be doing it uh, on a one-on-one -on -one basis. And uh, this is true both for the, for the fund and, and for the functioning of MOBA in general, I think. Thank you, Bea and Zuzi. Um, I have a question from uh, Ali in Malaysia, uh, who asked, could the panelists share their experience and collaborative housing projects in developing countries? Um, you know, with, uh, what is the funding percentage uh, you know, to share, uh, if, if, if that is one of the funding mechanisms, uh, and managing the legal aspects? So maybe Bea and Leia, you, uh, since you are involved in, uh, with Urba Monde in developing in other parts of the world outside of, of Europe, you could uh, share some of your thoughts on this. Um, well, maybe I'll start and then hand over to, to Leia, who's working on, on the different context, but um, let's say in, in one of the models that is actually very inspirational to us even uh, in Europe is, um, you know, the model developed by SDI and ACHR and community funds that it starts basically with the basic idea that savings are at the core of, you know, like any um, community led process um, that people can develop and jointly develop. So what they do is really to encourage um, local community savings and to pull them together at um, a federation or umbrella organization level or at the city level. Um, and this is really uh, also a tool to build a community which is just as important as um, yeah, bringing together the capital. And then, um, well, of course, in what we also try to do is in, to bring you know, international development money into into this idea of investing directly into the into community funds so into self-managed um financial mechanisms that are managed by the people themselves um and there's some examples of this for instance in senegal that we are working on um of revolving funds that are managed by a federation of um yeah of, of local savers or saving groups um and then also Maybe Leah can also speak a bit to, to other um, projects in Asia oh, or yeah. North America. <laughs> <laughs> I think you, you mentioned the community savings group. That's a, a very important model. But if you look at Latin American housing cooperatives uh, that are based on the mutual aid uh, model, um, they, they are more looking for uh, public subsidies. So um, they're more in the in the struggle to get the legal framework and support from the public authorities. Um, but um, the idea is also to collaborate with international organizations to sometimes just launch a first project, a, a pilot experience in one country. That's what happened in Central America, uh, where they reproduced or um, adapted the, the cooperative housing model that comes from Uruguay. Um, and it started first with international cooperation um, funds, but the idea is really to strengthen the communities to to get them also to to have this uh, own savings, I guess, and to get the public um, legal framework to support this kind of model. All right, thank you. 
So let's uh, move on to our next uh, our next discussion. So what role can cooperatives play across countries and regions to support these processes and, and strengthen the movement? Hans, do you want to, to launch us in this discussion? Yes, uh, thank you. Um, well, uh, in Switzerland, I'll probably talk a bit more uh, about Switzerland. Uh, we managed to, to get the uh, funding from members, uh, the share money down to 6% uh, by means also Gauthier managed. So uh, uh, mentioned. So I like to issue uh, strengthen two things uh, or, or to, to mention two, two systems we have. They're both based on, on solidarity. One is the Swiss Solidarity Fund. Um, because it's once you can move into a cooperative, you should not forget what brought you there. Now, people being solidary with each other. So Swiss cooperatives contribute on a voluntary basis up to 800,000 Swiss francs a year to this fund, which helps then smaller cooperatives that are lacking seed capital in financing their project. And the, the key success point in, in this solidarity fund is um, it's on a national level, so it leverages the individual contributions. It's not uh, on, a, on a local level. Uh, the second, it's a grant. It's not a donation. Funds must be paid back over uh, a longer period of time and can then be reinvested. So it's a revolving fund. Um, and uh, my most favorite uh, uh, key success point is to be eligible to this fund it's mandatory to adopt the model bylaws of the Cooperative Housing Association, including that you oblige, oblige yourself to the cost rent, to the no speculation and to a democratic framework. Therefore, we secure the founding principles uh, of the Swiss cooperative housing movements uh, to be promoted even further. And I mentioned it before, we have a, a second solidarity thing. It's the ABZ Solidarity Fund. Our members, the, the people living in our flats, are funding by five Swiss francs a month, which is a very low amount. The ABZ Solidarity Fund, and on the contrary to the Swiss Solidarity Fund, it off offers affront perdu funding. Uh, and as I mentioned, we're proud that we could support MOBA with uh, 28,000 euros, I think, seed capital in 2019 to set up uh, this revolving fund in Southeast Europe, which is a great thing. Thank you, Hans. Bea, do you want to, to talk about the uh, Fonds pour l'habitat solidaire? Yes, and maybe also more generally. I mean, um, I guess many of you or all of you know that um, cooperation between cooperatives is one of the um, principles of, of cooperatives. And we strongly believe that this can be actually a game changer um, or at least uh, leverage um, additional support or more substantial support for these kind of initiatives. So. This is really also what was behind the idea of, of the Mobile Housing Development Fund. As um, Hans said, it's very important that cooperatives and established organizations such as ABZ do support these kind of initiatives. Um, but also, we well, we also launched another initiative very locally at the Genevan level. So we created a deposit fund, which is called the Fonds pour l'habitat solidaire. Um, whereby people can, maybe cooperatives, but also anyone actually can support um, that solidarity fund, um, deposit money either as a loan or a donation. Um, and this money is then um, loaned out to revolving funds, self-managed revolving funds at the moment, either in Senegal or Nicaragua, where we support um, community housing initiatives. Um, but yeah, more generally, as I said, the idea be behind this is also that um, what is basically the, the level of action that we can have as individuals or as collectives in supporting our peers in, in, in developing their own solutions? Um, and what, what role can you know, international solidarity have um, at different levels in, in developing not only pilot initiatives, but uh, as in the case of MOBA or also in other initiatives that we support, really to build uh, housing models uh, on the longer term. Um, and it was very interesting actually just to share a personal experience as well when we presented the, 
um, the Mobile Housing Development Fund and these ideas about mobile at the ABZ um, assembly. It was interesting to see that people say, yeah, this is, um, this is really the idea that was behind um, the cooperative movement that was founded 100 years ago in Switzerland. And it's great to see um, that we kind of can go back to also to, to this um, motivation that was behind there and remember that we all started off small and, and that this movement grew immensely in, in Switzerland and that we want to give this opportunity to others um, in other places. So it was really good to see that. Yes, and it, it's one of the one of the principles of uh, the cooperative model is you know cooperating among cooperatives, um, and uh, you know nice to see you know that uh, Swiss money is uh, you know from from cooperatives uh, is going to develop uh, you know is supporting cooperative housing in in, in other countries. And, uh, you know, and it's like a snowball effect, you know, and when, you know, when, when MOBA will have, uh, you know, their solidarity fund or their revolving fund uh, up and running, you know, they'll be able to, you know, provide funding for even more cooperative housing. Um, um, also, just maybe just to add to this thought, uh, I'm going a bit back to what Gautier said earlier about like, you know, reinventing the economy. And I think it also really speaks to the, the idea that finance should be at the service of people like finance is should enable um, local development for people and by the people. And this is, uh, yeah, some of the ways that we, we try to kind of reinvent and hack the system. And uh, all of us are doing it. We're, we're working on housing projects because finance is such a central topic. Mm -hmm. And information is also uh, very important, you know, having the, the resources and, and the tools uh, and, you know, and access to that information and to the to the expertise, um, which uh, the Cohabitat uh, digital platform has. It's, it's sharing information on uh, different uh, community led communities throughout the world and what their financing mechanisms are and, uh, you know, and their, their governance model. Um, do you want to talk a little bit more about, about the Cohabitat platform, Leia, or, or Leia? Yes, just, just really briefly. So this is one of the tools that we're developing through the Cohabitat network, um, which is about documenting um, yeah, community housing projects experiences. And as you said, like it's, it's very important to document um, not only, you know, the results, but also the process that led to it and to enable like, you know, peer sharing among uh, different cooperators, but also like anyone who's interested in these topics. So yes, please um, have a look at it and add to it. It's a collaborative platform. So really the idea is that, um, yeah, anyone can contribute to it and that we can outsource this information on, on community housing um, worldwide, not just in Europe. I just added the, uh, the website to the Facebook comments. Um, uh, Gauthier, Leia, uh, would you like to, or, or sorry, Hans, I think you wanted to jump in. Um, yeah, about um, sharing sharing knowledge because peer pioneering is fun, but it also consumes a lot of energy, mainly by the people involved. And um, for Kraftwerk Kaiser, it's another pioneering cooperative in Zurich. It took more than 10 years to recover from the stresses and strains uh, by establishing their first settlement. So this doesn't have to be. And so we formed a cooperative called IDE Cooperative uh, in order to promote and share knowledge educate people and offer a network for the people. And of course, lobby on a national level for the legal form cooperative. It's a, a newly established cooperative. Um, there's also the, the, the big Swiss cooperatives are part of that. And we are, we are hoping to uh, share more of, of uh, share more resources for, for you all in, in this community. Thank you, Hans. Uh, Leia, can you speak uh, maybe a little bit about the the, the Uruguayan model that FUBAM uh, is disseminating, um, you know, in other in other countries? Yeah, this is one of the successful examples of uh, knowledge sharing and on an international level. So um, actually, um, it is a south to south uh, cooperation between the Federation, the Uruguayan Federation of Housing Cooperatives um, by Mutual Aid in Uruguay, 
which is a model that was uh, born in the 70s and was really successful to bring adequate housing to low income uh, people. So uh, they actually uh, shared uh, their model to other countries in the Latin American region. Um, they initiated uh, in 2001 uh, an international transfer of their model, like they say, uh, which follows the, the key principles, like I already mentioned it, uh, of solidarity, democratic participation, self-management self and mutual aid, and uh, collective ownership. Uh, they brought it to uh, Central America to start in El Salvador. And with the support of uh, the Swedish Cooperative Center, which is now called We Effect, and also government ag agencies and grassroots organizations, uh, FUGVAM, the, the Uruguayan Federation, has transferred the approach to other 15 countries uh, between 2001 and 2012 across Latin America. And each time they were uh, trying to adapt the model to local conditions in different contexts and setting also up national federations, which was a very important aspect uh, to actually manage to get this model uh, developed in these countries. Uh, and through these federations, they try to actually influence the government policy in each country. They, uh, they won in 2012 the World Habitat Award for this South-to-South uh, -South cooperation. And um, today they still are working on international uh, transfer of their model also in South America. And they have uh, established a very interesting training methodology through their own school in Uruguay, which is based on popular education. And um, I think it would be really worth to share also this, uh, this methodology broader. Yes, and in fact, uh, our, our next webinar that we're planning in August will be on, on this exact topic uh, and how uh, Fugbam uh, is, uh, you know, sh has shared knowledge with a group in uh, Catalan in Spain. Um, so we're just lining up the, the speakers for that. And uh, so watch out for more details. Uh, so yeah, we're planning on having this uh, in you know, mid towards late August. Um, so, uh, Gauthier, did you want to add anything on, you know, the solidarity mechanisms in, in the UK? I mean, yes, I suppose um, one thing to, to add on this is the fact there is a, a great need of it in the UK, uh, because besides some of the mechanisms I've mentioned before, so the Radical Sloan Fund or things like that, there isn't actually a very well-structured uh, solidarity mechanism in the UK. Uh, and that's a great shame because there were lots of housing co-ops being set up, which are now mature housing co-op in the sense they don't have any more debt. Um, so they make large amount of surplus, are sat on large amount of assets. And of course there is some kind of peer-to-peer -peer support and peer-to-peer -peer lending. And, you know, they, they sort of uh, some time to support one new projects. They, they might kind of provide small loans or something, but you know, they, they're already busy managing their, their co-op and they're also not financial experts and they, they're not, necessarily, yes, and also kind of investment experts, and we don't yet have a real mechanism to mutualize all of those resources. Um, and in fact, this is something I'm, I'm working on at the moment to set up like a pilot of a cooperative, of a housing cooperative development fund. Um, and in fact, if there's any uh, housing co-ops, uh, British housing co-ops in the audience, if they want to contact me uh, about this pilot, I'd be more than happy to kind of share what, what we're doing at the moment, but yeah, we just got some funding to set up something like that um, because we, we don't really have it and it is really key to implement uh, those, those solidarity mechanisms because I think, you know, when, when people do benefit from some kind of solidarity when, when the co-op gets started up, uh, get, get set up and then in the long term, it, it, I think it's really important there is a mechanism to put that, uh, to put solidarity back into helping the sector as a whole. And how, how can people get in touch with you? Go to uh, I don't know if there is any my, my contact in, in the on, on the page or something, but otherwise um, they can. Uh, can they find they can you on the radical roots? Uh, uh, probably not because um, no, but they can probably find me on Cooperatives UK website, or they can contact. Or maybe I can put like a. a um, 
a contact in the in the chat of the Facebook. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, that would be great. Um, and um, and I'll, I just wanted to share a little bit about uh, you know the CHI's role, Cooperative Housing International, uh, in you know in helping to you know to to build you know the 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 links and and the connections and, and the solidarity um you know basically we're you know like you know this webinar is an example of you know linking uh you know different actors uh working in the cooperative housing sector um and within the wider cooperative cooperative movement uh and uh you know linking groups that are involved in development like rooftops uh we affect uh, you know for technical resources and, and expertise because um, you know, one thing that uh, you know, I'd like to remind people is that we're we're not directly involved in in development, but we you know we we connect people with uh, with people that are working on the ground on on development. And um, you know, an example is uh, you know, in being part of the cohabitat network, uh, in, and and you know, and being connected to you know different different players uh, around the world, uh, you know, like MOBA, ABZ. Uh, you know, radical roots. Uh, you know, we we wouldn't know of each other if it wasn't for for the cohabitat network. Um, and uh, you know, and 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 through the cohabitat network, we you know we're and, and through the cooperative movement, you know, we're facilitating peer to peer exchanges. Uh, you know, through panel discussions, you know, this webinar, sharing best practices and, and strengthening, you know, the co-op movement by, by sharing, you know, these good practices and, and raising awareness of the potential, you know, of, of, co of the co-op, uh, you know, housing solution, um, you know, the, the important role, uh, you know, that cooperative housing, you know, can play uh, in, in providing, uh, you know, aff affordable, adequate housing, uh, you know, and, and community housing, um, you know, and especially in these times where the financialization of housing, uh, you know, has created, you know, cr you know, significant housing inequality and, and unaffordability. Um, I wanted to just quickly move to a question from uh, from one of our attendees, which is COVID related. We managed to not mention COVID once so far. <laughs> um, and the question is, what specific measures or advice um, do panelists have? Uh, in terms of accelerating back to housing activities, uh, you know, during the, you know, this, this transition to the post COVID-19 era. Anyone have uh, any, any insights or uh, can share, you know, their, their experiences in, in transitioning uh, back to, you know, normal housing activities or as normal as can, as can be at the moment. Anyone want to jump well, in here? I, uh, I could say something. In, in the beginning, we thought it doesn't affect us, but then I realized that uh, by not getting close to each other, we were prevented from discussing with, with each other in person. And uh, uh, I judged that as uh, being key of, of our democratic understanding of, of cooperatives. So um, what we are now heavily investing is um, even further as we do it now is in digitalization. Uh, so in order to assist us uh, having discussions and uh, decision-making power on a digital basis. Uh, and we're really looking forward to that because we're, we're gonna roll out a new version of our app that we programmed in, in summer in order to, to facilitate uh, uh, the decision-making process on a digital level. Thank you, Hans. Zuzi? I, I have a more general comment that I think this situation really showed how, how we need to come up with new kinds of housing solutions because, um, for example, well, in places where access to housing is based mainly on mortgages, it's such a crisis when, when you know, people lose their jobs and their income from one day to another, it um, well, it, it really has. Well, if you have a mortgage to pay, that can become a, a, a drastic problem. And uh, so I, I'm kind of hoping that uh, that this crisis could have an effect of uh, of opening up spaces of it for imagining other kinds of, of housing models. And uh, and so it kind of, I think, brought it home to people how. How how vulnerable our current housing system is, 
and then it might also have a practical impact of I know at least temporarily lower real estate prices which could make it easier for cooperatives to to access properties for example yeah and it, it also stresses the importance of of having housing of having shelter because uh, there are you know millions around the globe that uh, that are not properly housed or not housed at all and, and are extremely vulnerable uh, and uh, you know so that that's definitely brought that situation to to light uh, during this pandemic um, just quickly scrolling through some of the Facebook uh, comments or questions. Someone uh, asked if we could uh, provide a list of all the organizations and resources mentioned in the webinar. So yeah, we 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 can do that, um, and we'll um, you know I'll, I'll sift through the questions after the webinar is over, and uh, and then we'll have a you know a, a sort of like a Q and A section uh, on our on our website uh, as a follow up to to the webinar. And um, and I and also someone asked about uh, the recording, so we'll we'll have the recording on on our on our website, and I believe the recording will be on Facebook for for a little while. You know, um, I don't think it's it stays there forever, but it'll be there for for a while. So um, so you'll be able to watch the the recording. So we're a little bit over our time, and uh, so I just wanted to uh, just uh, do a quick little little wrap up. I want to thank our, our panelists for, for sharing their, uh, their knowledge and their experiences and, and their and their insight. Um, you know, people are find, find these webinars very, very useful, uh, very interesting to hear about what different, uh, what different countries are doing and the different models that are that are being used around the world. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, we plan on having our, our next webinar in Spanish um, uh, to talk about the, uh, the Uruguayan mutual um, self-help model and how they are sharing that, that model throughout, uh, throughout other countries. Uh, and then this one will be with, uh, with the Catalan cooperative. And um, and also we will send out an evaluation to uh, to attendees to to get your feedback to find out uh, how we did and and what you found helpful and what you like to hear about in the future and. Um, for those that aren't following us already on, on social media, you can follow us on, on Facebook, on Instagram, on Twitter, and on LinkedIn. And we have our website at uh, housinginternational.coop. We have uh, a resource section with uh, a searchable function. So if you're looking for any particular type of, uh, of resource, you, know, uh, you, can, you can search for it. Um, by by country or by topic and also by type, you know, whether it's a video or a research paper. Um, so lots of resources there. We're constantly adding to it. If you have any resources yourself that you think would be useful for, for, for us to share with others, um, you know, feel free to, uh, to send to me. Uh, I'm at jlapalm uh, at chi.coop. And... Um, and then, yeah, feel free to visit the uh, the Cohabitat digital platform for some inspiration uh, to see, you know, what what other types of community led uh, housing uh, has been developed throughout the world. There's tons and tons and tons of of examples on there. You, there's a searchable map. You can uh, you can go around the world and and see what uh, what's going on uh, in uh, community led housing, and um, and then if you are uh, a housing group yourself and you'd like to share your housing, uh, you, you can add to it. It's like a, it's like a Wikipedia for, for housing. So you can, you can add um, pictures, videos, and, uh, and then you know, describe uh, you know, the, the background information on, uh, on how your housing was developed. And even if you are you know, in development, you, you can also enter your information there. Uh, we'd like to hear from you. Um, and uh, so, yeah, thank you very much for, for joining us. Thanks again to, to the panel, 
for sharing your your knowledge and and your and your wisdom and um and good luck with uh all of your continuing endeavors uh in in, in especially you know in, in working from home and uh not having uh the same access to the you know the the, the person to person uh contact uh, that we're used to it's a, a different way of, of working and, and and a little bit isolating but uh you know thanks to the technology we we're able to connect today and uh and have this uh this great conversation and uh and although it's been going on for almost two hours it, it feels like it just flew by and we could you know continue talking about this for for a long time but uh, we will be talking uh, again tomorrow with, uh, with our Cohabitat colleagues. We have a, a forum tomorrow, so we will talk to you then again. And um, yeah, if, if anyone has uh, anything else to that, you know, any kind of last minute bits of knowledge that you'd like to add, uh, now, is, now is your time. And I'm just gonna take a little quick pick, uh, peek here at a couple more questions. Um, we have thanks for everyone for this webinar. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks for the good wishes. Um, and uh, oh yeah, and there was one question about, uh, about how CHI can assist uh, groups, you know, in, in, in creating regional networks. And you know, so as I mentioned earlier, we you know we can we can facilitate the the connection of of, of different people, different you know different actors, and uh, you know and initiate you know an, um, you know like a first meeting, perhaps through Zoom. We can you know we can you know get a bunch of people that are interested in forming a regional network to you know to get people together and uh, and then to get you started on 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 working together and and sharing sharing your uh you know sharing all of the capacity and knowledge that uh that you all have on an individual level so that the whole group can can benefit from from having uh you know the strength in numbers and and having uh you know group access to to information so uh we're happy to to facilitate that uh in different regions in the world there's a, a group in south america that uh that has formed that uh, you know, a little different from from MOBA, the the group in in uh, in Central uh, Eastern Europe, uh, where it's uh, you know established co-op housing uh, associations or, or federations from from all over South America, who you know meet a few times a year to uh, you know to share knowledge to talk about uh, you know different issues and 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 common you know common obstacles and and uh, so um, so we're you know we're happy to to facilitate that uh, anywhere else in in the world um, so yeah so we on on that note uh, thanks again and uh, we look forward to seeing you all at our next webinar in August uh, well, it will be in Spanish, but uh, we will see about uh, maybe doing some, you know, maybe some simul simultaneous translation or, uh, you know, someone can, you know, do some translation uh, in the comments. We'll, we'll, we'll discuss that. We'll figure something out. <laughs> All right. So thanks, everyone. And, Thank you. Uh, we'll Thank, see you. You Thank you. Soon. Yeah. Thank you very much.